in the meet the professor session, uh, we are highlighting obviously all MDS. My task was talking about the lower risk MDS. So I think, you know, and we probably will discuss this further. First, like, I, I think really categorizing what's lower risk MDS is very important. So obviously we use the revised IPSS scoring system. We complement that with mutation testing. Uh, we look at the patient-related factors. Uh, and at the end, if we label the patients as lower risk MDS, obviously the treatment is geared to alleviate cytopenias so far. And there are different patterns, obviously. So in majority of the patients, we will be treating anemia. Uh, rarely, maybe 10% of the patients will present with isolated thrombocytopenia. And for those patients, uh, options of treatment are relatively limited in general hypomethylating agents, uh, immunosuppressive therapy with antithymocyte globulin and cyclosporin is an option, to, particularly for younger patients. Or sometimes, you know, we use uh, thrombopathic uh, stimulating agents uh, like uh, L-thrombobag. There is data from our colleagues in Italy in lower risk MDS showing efficacy in those isolated thrombocytopenia. But that's around like 10% of the cases. There is really no magical platelet number even where you pull the trigger on the treatment. In, in general, I typically, you know, when they drop below the 50 or 30, would think of starting the treatment. But obviously, you have to factor a lot of other issues like the patient comorbidities, uh, other bleeding tendencies, etc. Isolated neutropenia is also rare in lower risk MDS, very rare. I typically don't treat patients with isolated neutropenia unless they had recurrent infections. Uh, studies in the past showed that regular use of GCSF did not impact the outcome for those patients. And the choices are, again, probably limited. Even with hypomethylating agents, 10 to 20 percent uh, responses may be in neutrophil response. And ATG cyclosporin can be an option for younger patients. But the bulk we are treating is really anemia. So the first question, obviously, we ask, is the anemia symptomatic? Uh, when do we pull the trigger in treatment of anemia and lower-risk MDS? And in general, obviously, patients that are transfusion-dependent, definitely that's an indication to treat. Patients that you know, are symptomatic with anemia. And in some cases, probably earlier intervention is important. Uh, uh, we get more responses. So... Uh, so those are the general guidelines. Uh, obviously, we go stepwise in managing anemia. The concomitant cytopenia, because sometimes we have patients that have anemia with thrombocytopenia and or neutropenia, those sometimes can dictate the choice of therapy, but not necessarily the indication to treat the patients. So erythroid stimulating agents, whether it's uh, erythropoietin or the longer acting derbypoietin, are typically our first step. They work particularly well in patients that have low transfusion burden or not transfusion dependent, uh, and in those patients that have an endogenous serum EPO level below 500. In that setting, the responses are high. If patients are getting transfusions on a monthly basis or their endogenous serum EPO level is high, those patients' chances of response is very low, uh, less than 10%. So we typically do somewhere around 8 to 12 weeks of trying the erythroid stimulating agents. If they are working, we drive the benefit out of it. If not, then obviously we move to the next step. So the next step, if patients are not responding to erythroid stimulating agents, we ask, uh, uh, you know, are they DEL5Q isolated anemia? And for those patients, obviously, particularly lenalidomide works very well in that subset of patients with uh, prior studies showing almost 70% transfusion independent. What's interesting or recent in, in DEL5Q, there was a study by the Spanish group looking at randomizing patients earlier on before they are transfusion dependent. So they are looking at time to transfusion dependency, which is very interesting endpoint in lower risk MDS, particularly in DEL5Q given the unique activity of lenalidomide. So in that study, they reported patients with anemia, but not transfusion dependent. Uh, so earlier on, randomized to five milligrams of lenalidomide, which is half of the typical dose that we use, and for two years only. And they showed that those patients that were treated with lenalidomide 
had almost like 70 months time to become transfusion independent compared to only a couple of years in the patients that were just observed. So I think this study is a little bit challenging the paradigm of waiting till the patients are like transfusion independent or like severely symptomatic in deletion 5Q. And it makes me think of maybe introducing the linalidomide a little bit earlier in the del 5Q. Now, again, del 5Q is only a unique subset. Uh, it's also important to, to, to note or say if patients have, you know, concomitant thrombocytopenia, particularly platelets less than 50, uh, severe neutropenia, and less than 500, even in the DEL5Q, the responses to lenalidomide, an, an unfortunately, are not high. If patients don't have DEL5Q, then our next question, do they have ring sidroblasts or a splicing mutation, the SF3B1? Because now we have the Luspatercept, which was approved uh, uh, last year for that subset of patients. So this patercept is a monoclonal antibody that neutralizes TGF beta cytokines or ligands, uh, and those turn to be important in regulating terminal erythroid maturation. And the drug had been uh, in, tested in phase one, phase two trials, and then a phase three called the medalist that particularly focused in patients with ring sidroblasts that were transfusion dependent. It's an injection subcutaneous every three weeks, and it showed superiority, obviously, to uh, uh, placebo, and the drug is approved. Uh, so it's an injection every three weeks. The dose can be escalated as the package inserts from 1 to 1.3 to 1.75 every two doses. Uh, Responses are roughly around 40%, or, uh, and there are some patients that will have more than, you know, uh, duration of transfusion and dependency. Uh, well tolerated, it does have fatigue the first couple of cycles, uh, uh, rarely, you know, arthralgias, myalgias, uh, uh, but in general, very well tolerated treatment with no signs of, you know, uh, increasing disease progression. Uh, again, the magnitude of benefit of lospatercept uh, is higher if those treatments were introduced in patients that are not heavily transfusion dependent. In those patients that were requiring more than six units of blood, there were transfusion reductions, but rarely we encountered in the study becoming transfusion independent. So again, after ESA failure in patients with ring sidroblasts, we should be thinking of lospatercept early after the ESA failure, not awaiting till patients become heavily transfusion dependent. And lospatercept obviously has been looked at, you know, other subtypes because the activity is not just limited to uh, ring sidroblast patients. So there is ongoing study called the command study, uh, looking at patients uh, uh, up front that are needing at some blood transfusion, randomizing them between erythropoietin and lospatercept. There are other studies looking at combinations, whether with lenalidomide or with uh, uh, erythroid stimulating agents. Uh, so we yet have to explore more the activity of lospatercept, but now it's available for patients with ring sidroblasts. If the patients don't have ring sidroblasts or not, deletion 5Q. In our practice, if they are younger, early in their course of disease, we do consider immunosuppressive therapy with ATG cyclosporin. This is one course of the antithymocytic globulin in the hospital, uh, followed by cyclosporin somewhere 6 to 12 months. And if you select patients that are younger, uh, not heavily transfusion dependent again uh, earlier in the disease, the responses can exceed 50% and they are durable responses. So, that's an option, again, for a limited number of patients. For the rest of the patients that are non-DEL5Q, non-ring sidroblasts, not candidates for immunosuppressive therapy, I think our choices are either still lenalidomide, which can be used at least in the United States uh, for non-DEL5Q, or hypomethylating agents. Uh, those are obviously unique treatments in the USA compared to Europe or Canada, where they are not approved for lower-risk MDS. But we use lenalidomide with or without uh, erythropoietin in non-DEL5, non-ring sidroblast patients, or in ring sidroblast patients after lospatercept failure, in those patients that have isolated anemia, so they have to have adequate platelets and good neutrophils. If there's concomitant cytopenias that even don't need treatment, then chances of lenalidomide working are not high, and the default option becomes the hypomethylating agents. But in those patients that have isolated anemia, Linalidomide with uh, erythropoietin could be a, va va a valid option for those patients with roughly around 30% responses. And in the past, we've published our experience on the sequence. If we use the linalidomide in the non 
than 5Q before hypomethylating agents that yielded higher responses while the response to hypomethylating agents were the same. So in our practice, again, we prefer using them before. Uh, then obviously, if patients have you know, gone through all those options, uh, or they have concomitant cytopenias, non-del 5Q, non-ring citroblast, uh, we, then the default is hypomethylating agents. In the United States, typically azacitidine is used as five days, and decitabine. We've done studies through the MDS consortium looking at three days regimen, uh, which seems promising. We are waiting for the randomization to confirm that. And obviously, oral hypomethylating agents are making their way. Uh, they, uh, there is oral decitabine that's approved for higher risk MDS, not for lower risk MDS. There is oral azacitidine that was tested in lower risk MDS, but the dosing is not yet figured. And it's important to point out that oral azacitidine is not equivalent to IV or subcutaneous azacitidine, while the oral decitabine is uh, almost 99% bioequivalent. Uh, obviously, clinical trials are always important. I feel very comfortable uh, enrolling patients on clinical trials at any time point in the lower risk MDS. Uh, we are looking at anti-inflammatory agents earlier in the disease. Uh, there are a couple of randomized clinical trials, uh, one with Mtilistat, that's a telomere inhibitor, that in the phase two showed uh, very robust 40% uh, response, uh, transudinal independency and durable, with some suggestion maybe even altering the natural history of the disease. So now it's finishing a phase three trial. And there is a drug called Oxadistat, that's a HIF pathway inhibitor, that's also in phase three and shown some promising activity in the phase one, phase two. So that's in general my approach for the lower risk. I think the first step, assuring that the patient's lower risk, then you know identifying the cytopenia. Some patients are okay to observe if they don't have significant profound cytopenia. Then if it's isolated thrombocytopenia or isolated neutropenia, and then as we discussed for the isolated anemia. Uh, 